Now it came about in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census should be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was first taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all were proceeding to register for the census, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him, and was with child. And it came about that while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And in the same region there were some shepherds, staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy which shall be for all people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign unto you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill among men. And it came about when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem then, and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. And they came in haste and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen this, they had made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which are told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart, and the shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told. On the Mount of Olives, outside the city of Jerusalem, Jesus, the promised Savior, was talking to four of his disciples, to Peter and Andrew, James and John. He told of the day when Jerusalem would be destroyed and that soon he must leave them, but that he would come again. Master, when will this be? What will be the sign when this is about to take place? Be careful that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be afraid. For this must first take place. But the end will not be at once. What will be the sign of the end, Lord? The end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be great earthquakes and famines in many places. And before all this, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. And you will be brought before governors and kings for my name's sake. In that hour, Master, what shall we say? Do not be anxious beforehand what you shall say. When the time comes, you will be given wisdom which none of your enemies will be able to withstand or contradict. What shall become of our families and friends in these days, Lord? You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, kinsmen and friends, and some of you they will put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake.
but not a hair of your head shall perish. By your patience, you will gain your souls. Jesus spoke to them for a long time, telling them of things that would come to pass, speaking in parables, seeking to prepare his disciples for the tragedy of his death and for carrying on his work after his departure. He warned them always to be on watch, for no man knew when the Son of Man would come again. A short time later, after Jesus had finished all his sayings and parables, he was again gathered together with his disciples. You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Jesus knew that what had been foretold in the scriptures must soon come to pass. The number of Jesus' followers was increasing with each passing day. As they gathered about him, they were held by the truth and warmth of his words. Among them were some of the temple rulers who were afraid that this man might destroy their leadership of the people. Totally unaware of Jesus' prediction of his own death, the priests and Pharisees who had gathered with the high priest Caiaphas were greatly alarmed by the reports of the activities of Jesus. You have heard how this rabble-rouser continues to speak against us, calling us wicked and adulterous. I say it is time he put a stop to the doings of this false prophet. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe him. And the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. You know nothing at all. You do not understand that it's better for you that one man should die for the people rather than the whole nation perish. But, but how can we take him? He's always surrounded by the people and we cannot risk their anger. We must find a time when he is away from the people. Even so, how can we possibly know of this in time to act when he is not in Jerusalem? The Passover is not far off. And he surely will come here for the feast. What do you think, Caiaphas? If he does come, then we must make every effort to find out where and how he might be taken alone. So from that day on, they took counsel how they might put Jesus to death. But they knew they must take him secretly when he was not with the multitude of his followers. Sometime later in Bethany, Jesus and his disciples were having supper with a number of other guests in the house of a man known as Simon the leper. It was not far from where, a short time before, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus himself was among the guests who were being served by Martha, Lazarus' sister, who had been so joyful at her brother's resurrection. Then Mary, Lazarus' other sister, also came in. She too had been devoted to Jesus for some time, and she welcomed this opportunity to show her love for the Savior. In those days, it was the custom to anoint the head or feet of a distinguished guest with precious oils and ointments. This was a gesture of respect and love, and Mary felt that she could do no less for her savior. Among those present was Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, who was very much displeased by Mary's action. Why such a waste? This ointment might have been sold for a large sum, and the money given to the poor. Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a fine thing for me. The poor you have always with you, and whenever you will, you can do good to them but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burying. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Actually, Judas was not at all concerned with the poor. Being a greedy man, he would have liked to see the ointment sold and the money from it put into the disciples' fund for the poor. Since he was in charge of the fund, he could have done with it as he wished. Meanwhile, in Jerusalem, the high priest had called another meeting of the rulers of the temple for the purpose of plotting Jesus' death. And at the very same time that the rulers of the temple were plotting, Judas Iscariot was making his way from Bethany toward Jerusalem. By then, 
Judas' mind was filled with evil thoughts. Hungry for money, Judas was now thinking of a plan to gain his own ends. For almost three years I have followed him, waiting for him to proclaim himself king of Israel. Why should I wait any longer? Isn't his cause a lost one? I wonder what the priests of the temple would do if I were to lead them to Jesus. No doubt they would pay well to know how they could trap him. And so, having decided upon a plan, Judas was more determined than ever to see the priests of the temple. There, the discussion over Jesus was still going on. So far, all their attempts to trick Jesus had failed, but they were still trying to find some way to trap him. But just then, a guard came in to tell the high priest Caiaphas that there was a man outside who wanted to see him about a matter of great importance. After presenting himself to Caiaphas, Judas began to explain the reason for his visit. But some of the rulers of the temple wondered why this man should have been invited into the council chamber. And they were curious to know the reason for this interruption. This man is Judas Iscariot, follower of Jesus of Nazareth. He tells me that he will see to it that Jesus falls into our hands. What will you give me if I deliver him to you? What do you think is a good price to offer this man? We should offer him enough. 30 pieces of silver is the price of a slave. That is a goodly sum. Let us pay him now and bind the bargain. We will pay you 30 pieces of silver. More than 1900 years ago, on the hill called Golgotha, there stood three crosses, symbols of the terrible tragedy which had taken place on that spring day. The Son of Man still hung limply from the nails that pierced his hands and feet. The Savior of the world was dead. And in Jerusalem, in the Hall of Judgment, where Jesus' crucifixion had been decided, Joseph of Arimathea, one of Jesus' secret followers had overcome his fears and had come to Pilate to ask for the body of the master that he might give it honorable burial. I see no reason for not granting your request, Joseph. But the law requires that I must know Jesus is dead. Have the officer in charge of the crucifixion sent to me. But I was there, Excellency. 
I saw Jesus die. I do not doubt your honesty, Joseph, but I must know from the officer himself. You are in charge of the crucifixion? I was, Your Excellency. Did you complete your task? I did. Then he is dead? Yes. Jesus of Nazareth, you are sure of him? I will always be sure of him, sir. What do you mean by that? He is dead, is he not? He is, sir. But... Truly, he was the Son of God. Your request is granted. You may take the body of Jesus. taking down the body of Jesus from the cross, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, another of the master's followers, brought it into a new tomb in a garden not far from the site of the crucifixion. There they tenderly wrapped the body of their master in linen and spices, as was the custom of the time. As the hour for the beginning of the Sabbath drew near, the two men were joined by others in order that they might set the huge stone over the entrance to the tomb. Other followers of Jesus had come with Joseph and Nicodemus. These were the three Marys. Mary, the mother of Joseph, Mary, the mother of James, and Mary Magdalene. They too, filled with sorrow and grief, had come to see the burial of the Master. But there were also enemies who, full of hatred, watched Jesus' burial with interest. These were the religious leaders and even though they had seen Jesus die with their own eyes, fear and suspicion were still in their hearts. Leaving one of their own on watch, they hastened to Pilate. Your Excellency knows this Jesus had a large following. He is dead. They cannot follow a dead man. Your Excellency, we know that he is dead. Nevertheless, his followers might cause more trouble. Trouble? How? Sir, we remember how this deceiver said while he was still alive. After three days, I will rise again. Since he is dead, what can you fear now? But your excellency, his followers might stir up more trouble than ever. Does your guilty conscience make you fear a dead man? Sir, we beseech you, order the tomb to be sealed until the third day or his disciples may come and steal him away and tell the people that Jesus has really risen from the dead. Then the last fraud would be worse than the first. You have caused me enough trouble over this man in whom I found no fault. But be done with it. You shall have your guard of soldiers. Go, make the tomb as secure as you can. This is ridiculous. First I have to watch the man die on the cross. Now I have to guard his tomb. Why? Now you're the priests are afraid Jesus might walk out. I heard that the priests are afraid some of his followers might steal the body and then tell everyone that their leader had risen from his grave. That's a lot of nonsense. Nonsense or not, we're here. And we'll be here for three whole days. This is the end. You're sure? Well, the tomb is sealed. I know what some of you are thinking. But remember, we have orders to guard this tomb. We will do our duty. To your station. It was still night, but the sunrise would soon come. The Sabbath had passed quietly. 
the long watch at the tomb of Jesus was coming to an end, and the soldiers were relaxed. So far, their constant vigilance had been rewarded. No one had tried to enter the tomb. This was good enough proof. The seal had not been broken. Yes, it seemed that the priests and Pharisees had attached too much importance to the prediction of the crucified one. But then, while the tired soldiers were looking forward to be relieved of their duty, See a thing. Look, the door is wide open. And then there was a great earthquake, and an angel came and rolled back the stone. His appearance was like lightning, and his raiment was white as snow. You must tell the people that, that Jesus' disciples came by night and stole his body away. While you were asleep. But it was not so. You can make it so. But what about Pilate? If he thought that we'd fallen asleep... We will satisfy Pilate and keep you out of trouble. So be it. And so the religious rulers, having bribed the Roman soldiers, could now spread their falsehood. After buying the soldiers' silence, they could claim that Jesus' followers had stolen his body while the soldiers slept. But in the meanwhile, Mary, the mother of James, and Mary Magdalene, and Salome, were coming to the now empty tomb, bringing with them sweet spices to anoint the body of their Lord. One thing concerned these sorrowing women. They were wondering how they would be able to roll away the huge stone from the door of the tomb. And then... Look! It has been moved. It's true. It is rolled away. They have taken away our Lord. They have taken him away. I must tell Peter and John. Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. Come, see the place where they laid him. Then go quickly and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling with astonishment and alarm, they suddenly ran away from the tomb. Peter, you must come to the tomb. The stone has been rolled away. They have taken our Lord. Taken him away? What is it, Peter? The stone has been moved. They have taken the Lord away. And we do not know where they have taken him. We must go to the tomb at once. When they saw the open tomb, they feared the worst. But when Peter led John into the tomb, and when John saw the neatly folded head napkin and the other clothes laying in the exact position in which they had been wrapped about Jesus' body, he knew that their master's body had not been stolen. Now he was sure that Jesus' own prophecy had been fulfilled. The master had risen. Because they have taken away my Lord. And I know not where they have laid him. Woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? Oh, sir, if you have taken him, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. 
Mary. I am not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. In the meantime, the two women who had gone to the tomb early that morning with Mary Magdalene were walking back to the city to report what the angel had told them. Master. All hail. Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. In the afternoon of that first Easter Sunday, two men, one of them named Cleopas, were walking from Jerusalem to a village called Emmaus. As they walked, they talked of the events of the past few days. And as they spoke together, Jesus himself drew near and joined them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. What is it that you are discussing? Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem that does not know what has happened there during these days? What things? As they continued on their journey, Cleopas told of what had happened in Jerusalem. How Jesus of Nazareth had been delivered by the chief priests and rulers and crucified how they had hoped that Jesus was the one to redeem Israel. He told Jesus of the women finding the empty tomb and of the angel telling them that Jesus had risen. Oh, foolish men, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things in order to enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them from the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they came near the village to which they were going, and Jesus made as though he would go farther. But they asked him to come and stay with them, for it was toward evening and the day was far spent. So Jesus went to stay with them, and when he was at the evening meal with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And suddenly their eyes were opened. Now they recognized him. And then he vanished out of their sight. Then Cleopas and his companion remembered how their hearts had burned within them when Jesus had talked to them on the way to Emmaus. That same hour they left the house and returned to Jerusalem to tell their experience to the disciples. In Jerusalem, Cleopas and his companion found the disciples and told how Jesus had joined them on the road to Emmaus and how they had finally recognized him. In turn, they learned that Jesus had also appeared to Peter. And as they talked... Peace be with you. Why are you troubled, and why do questions arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit has not flesh and bones as you see that I have. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. Receive the Holy Spirit. Whosoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven unto them. Whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Later, the disciples were again assembled together, and this time Thomas was with them. But I tell you, it is true, Thomas. The Lord came to us here, in this room. 
he showed us the wound. Yes. And before that, I saw him with my own eyes. And he also walked with Cleopas and another on the road to Emmaus and broke bread with them. Mary Magdalena, too, saw him at the tomb. And the other two women who had gone with her also met the Lord when they were coming back to tell us of the resurrection. And the master told them to bring us word that we would see him in Galilee. But it is true, Thomas. The Lord has risen. Except I shall see in his hand the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And so it was that eight days after the Lord's last appearance, the disciples were again assembled in the room, and Thomas was with them. finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not be faithless, but believing. My Lord, my God, you have believed because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. The third time that Jesus appeared to some of his disciples was early one morning on the coast of the Sea of Galilee. He had told them to cast their net on the right side of the boat. Having done so, they had caught a great number of fish. Now they were finishing their breakfast, and Jesus, having something to say to Peter, took him aside. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Feed my lambs. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Tend my sheep. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Sometime later, Jesus met with a large group of his followers on a mountainside in Galilee. Here he outlined for them, in words that could not be misunderstood, the work they were to follow. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Then on the Mount of Olives, outside the city of Jerusalem, 40 days after he had risen from the dead, Jesus met with his disciples again. They had often come to this spot to rest and pray during the time of his ministry. Now he was about to give them new instructions. Wait here in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father which you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but before many days you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the end of the earth.
after Jesus had led his disciples until they were over against Bethany, this was to be the scene of his last departure from them. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken unto them, was received up into heaven. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. <laughs>